Hello, and welcome to What Goes Up, a weekly markets podcast. My name is Mike Regan. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg. And I'm Waldana Hayek, a cross-asset reporter with Bloomberg. And this week on the show, well, life comes at you fast sometimes. Not too long ago, this week's guests was one of the economists arguing for a so-called no landing in the economy. In other words, the Fed would be able to vanquish the inflation problem and the economy would be able to keep humming along. Then, in the blink of an eye, Silicon Valley Bank failed, becoming the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history, and the whole outlook changed. Now he's in the camp that believes we'll see a hard landing. In other words, the U.S. economy won't be able to avoid a recession. We'll get into exactly what this prominent economist sees coming and why his outlook changed so quickly. But, uh, Viltana, first I have to ask, are you a fan of March Madness? No, I only watch football. You won't you football should know exclusively? That. No March? So you're not doing the brackets? No, I know we have a Bloomberg Terminal brackets. I you, haven't even looked at it. You're the best person to do the brackets, though, then, because... Why, because of all the tall Eastern European people I should know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that... No, but you'll, you could just take the lower number in each one. People like me who've seen, like, you know, 10 of these teams play, are, are, our opinions are completely polluted by the 10 games we saw this year. I can't even name 10 teams. <laughs> <laughs> just pick the lower number seed. I'm, I'm curious. You do that all the way through. Fine, let's do it. Do I win anything? I'll give you a dollar. Deal. Which is enough to buy the UK operations of SVB, SVB. Bank, Oh my God. No, I would need like a dollar thirty or something. <laughs> right? or it was one pound. Trading, yeah. one pound yes. <laughs> I don't know what it's trading at. Yes. I made that up. <laughs> but I do want to bring our guest in. I'm so happy to have him. It's Torsten Slock, Chief Economist at Apollo Global Management. Torsten, thank you so much for coming in and, and joining us on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. So maybe we can start with what Mike was just talking about because you write daily notes. They're extremely prominent on Wall Street, I would say. I, I know on Bloomberg TV, everybody was talking about your note from this week where you were talking about uh, when the facts change, my view changes. So can we just take this as, um, can you talk about that view changing as a way to explain what exactly happened over the last couple of days and why your view has changed? Yeah. So as Mike was saying, up until uh, here this weekend, the situation was very clear that the Fed had been raising rates because inflation was too high. As a result of that, the interest rate sensitive components of GDP had responded, meaning housing had started to slow down, the auto sector has started to slow down because they were sensitive and they are sensitive to interest rates going up, and durable goods more broadly, meaning everything you buy, furniture, washers, dryers, everything that requires financing was responding by slowing down. And the problem for the Fed was that those components of GDP that are interest rate sensitive only make up 20% of the economy. The 80% of the economy that services was actually still doing fine. So people were still traveling on airplanes, still going to restaurants, still staying at hotels, going to theme parks, concerts, sporting events. Across the board, the consumer services sector was still doing really well. So the debate up until recently was that, well, why is the economy not slowing down when the Fed is raising rates? Why is it? that the consumer is still doing so well. And a very important answer to that was that, well, there was still a lot of savings left across the income distribution, that households still had plenty of savings left after the pandemic, either because they saved it because they didn't travel and go to restaurants during the pandemic, or because they had received transfers from the government, or simply because that they didn't spend as much money as their income over the last several quarters. And up until recently, the debate was, why is this economy not slowing down? And that's what we can call that what you want, but that's what we have called the no landing. The economy was just not slowing down. And that was the reason why inflation continued to be in the range of five, six, seven percent. That's why the Fed had to raise rates. And if I on my Bloomberg screen type T-A-Y-L and look at the Taylor rule, which would tell you what should the Fed funds rate be as a function of unemployment and inflation, it would say that the Fed funds rate should be as high as nine or 10 percent. So up until recently, everything was fine. The economy was doing well. The Fed was gradually trying to slow things down. They weren't succeeding as much as they would like, but it was just humming nicely forward. What happened, of course, here with Silicon Valley Bank was that suddenly, out of the blue, at least for financial markets, really nobody, uh, and I think that's safe to say at this point, had seen this coming. And as a result of that, 
suddenly we all had to go back to our drawing boards and think about, okay, but what is the importance of the regional banks? What is the importance of the banking sector in terms of credit extension? And we look at the data from the Fed, you will see that roughly a third of assets in the US banking sector are in the small banks. And here a small bank is defined as bank number 26 to 8,000. A large bank is number one to 25 ranked by assets. So that means that there's a long tail of banks. Some of them are fairly big, but the further you get out, of course, the smaller they get. And the key question for markets today is, how important are the small banks that are now facing issues with deposits, facing issues with funding costs, facing issues with what that might mean for their credit books, and also facing issues with what does it mean if we now also have to do stress tests on some of these smaller banks? So the short answer to your question is that this episode with the Silicon Valley Bank that we have seen here more recently uh, markets are doing what they're doing and there's a lot of things going on but what is really the major issue here in my view is that we just don't know now what is the behavioral change in terms of lending willingness in the regional banks and given the regional banks make up 30% of assets and roughly 40% of all lending that means that the banking sector has now such a significant share of banks that are now really at the moment thinking about what's going on and the risk with that is that the slowdown that was already underway because of the Fed raising rates might now come faster simply because of this banking situation. So that's why I changed my view from saying no landing, no landing, everything is fine, to now saying, well, wait a minute, there is a risk now that things could slow down faster because we just need to see over the coming weeks and months ahead what is the response going to be in terms of lending from this fairly significant part of the banking sector that is now uh, going through this turbulence we're seeing. Mike, is this where I add my disclaimer? Yes, I have a mortgage pending with First Republic. So I'm in the midst of this. It, you, you, what a great timing on picking a mortgage. <gasps> at, at, you top ticked that pretty well, huh? And I great job picking timing. the bank, too. Thank you. Know? you. <laughs> well, did did you log great. in the interest rate? Yes, but you know, they answer every single time I call. Yeah. Shout well, out to, to my banker, Kyle. But uh, Torsten, you know, I think there's such a unique element to this, if you want to call it a crisis, in that. Typically, when you're worried about the banking system and the quality of their assets, you think about the credit quality. You know, uh, financial crisis, yes, it was a drop in the valuation of securities, but it was a result of deteriorating credit quality among mortgage borrowers. This is so different right now. I mean, we haven't really seen any deterioration in creditworthiness yet. So will it play out in a similar fashion as far as curtailing the supply of credit? Or is there a reason to think it'll be different? And, you know, just to tag one more question on the, the end of that, is it possible we still have another shoe to drop with the deterioration of credit quality going forward? Absolutely. So uh, I started my career at the IMF in the 1990s. And the first thing you learn literally on the first day, it is that a banking crisis and a banking run normally happens exactly as you're saying, Mike, because there are credit losses on the bank's books. We saw that in 2008, subprime mortgages, credit credit losses. We saw that for Northern Rock. We saw that for Lehman Brothers. We saw that for Bear Stearns. If you go back to the 1990s, you saw that on the savings and loan crisis, there were commercial real estate losses. And these were very illiquid losses. This couldn't just be sold very quickly. That is exactly, as you're pointing out, very, very different. We have basically never had a banking crisis in a strong economy. And the irony of this situation is that it is actually the most liquid asset, namely treasuries, that turned out to be the problem. So that's why if you do have now that, uh, let's say, 10-year rates, now they've been going down quite a bit more recently, let's say that they go down to, say, 25 or even 2%, that will be helping incredibly on the bank's balance sheet because it is the liquid side of the balance sheets that are have, at least in, in this episode, been the main problem in yeah. terms of what the issues are. So that's why, to your last point, exactly the fear is that if we now have not only the lagged effects of the Fed hiking rates already slowing the economy, we've already seen various indicators, as I mentioned, in particular interest rate sensitive indicators beginning to slow down, but if you now have a magnified effect that the slowdown might come a bit faster, then, of course, we do ultimately also need to look at what does that mean for credit losses for everything that banks have on their balance sheets. It's such a unique phenomenon. It, re- it really is. You know, who would have ever thought the treasuries would be the riskiest thing? It is so unusual. Normally, it's the liquid stuff that gets the attention, but it just shows the complication of this issue here that in the situation now where it is treasuries and all this held to maturity and available for sale, there's a lot of fine details on that, but the bottom line still is the same, that the bottom line was that because interest rates went up, this created some problems for certain banks. Yeah, and so what everybody in the market is saying 
they were waiting for the moment that the Fed broke something, and now something has broken. So I'm wondering how you are recalculating what you're expecting from the Fed. Everybody is talking about this because obviously they're going to be meeting in a couple of days. What are your expectations? Yeah, so I would say a very important consideration here, of course, is that we've, if you look back in the history books, it is, of course, important to consider, is this just like Orange County in the early 1990s? Is this like LTCM in 98? Is this essentially the same as the LDI crisis in a just different form where this is something that will come and go and will basically be back on track very quickly? The main problem with this, and this was the main reason why I changed my view, is that this is for the banking sector. And the banking sector just happens to play a really, really important role uh, in the Orange County, LCCM, even the LDI in the UK. It was still the case that this caused some ripple effects, but it was not as essential for economic growth as the banking sector is. So the challenge today, of course, looking to the Fed meeting, is that there are some risks, of course, for the Fed to financial stability. And it is very clear that up until, if we had uh, spoken about this like a week ago, then I would have said they're going to go 50, nothing to discuss, uh, no landing, everything full steam ahead. The Fed needs to cool things down. But today, it is suddenly the case that the top priority, which we thought until recently was all inflation, has been replaced and put into the backseat of the car. Now the top priority is financial stability. And when the top priority is financial stability, then, of course, the Fed needs to be absolutely sure that the financial system is stable and financial markets are calm and that, therefore, that credit is flowing to consumers, to corporates, to residents residential real estate, commercial real estate, with the idea that if that is not the case, then you are at risk of having, obviously, a much harder landing. So that's why financial stability being the top risk would lead me to the conclusion that they can always raise rates later if this does turn out to be like Orange County and LTCM. But at the moment, the biggest risk going into this meeting is certainly that financial stability needs to uh, be, uh, financial system needs to be stable uh, for them to feel comf- comfortable uh, before they can begin to even think about raising rates again. It, it's interesting. You keep hearing hard landing. It sounds like me on the ski slope in, in Vermont, you know. <laughs> but, but could we I'd put, love to see that. <laughs> could, which is, uh, I will say, it can be a painful thing. Well, maybe this. it's me when I'm playing soccer on Pier 5 out in Brooklyn Bridge Park <laughs> where there's cement underneath the surf, yeah. <laughs> but let's put some numbers on that, you know, because we, we are starting from such such a extremely low base in the unemployment rate. The last jobs report was still very strong. I forget what three hundred thousand was it? Two hundred fifty thousand jobs. Yeah, three hundred eleven. Three hundred eleven. Good memory. What does a hard landing look like as far as unemployment and GDP? Yeah, this is really important because, again, if we already were set up for this situation where the Fed trying to slow the economy down and the Fed would raise, raise 25 basis points, they would look around and say, how is the data responding? They would go another 25 basis points. Of course, they did a little bit more earlier, but they've been going more slowly and they have been thinking about going more slowly. In that situation, it's a more controlled slowdown. Even in that scenario, remember, there was a big discussion, can the Fed actually achieve a soft landing? And a lot of people were saying, no, they cannot, because you cannot micromanage the economy. So we already had that debate even before this situation now in the banking sector. But now think about if you add on to that, what's going on in the banking sector. The risk in the banking sector now is that if banks now are beginning to tighten credit conditions simply because they need to reorganize and repair their balance sheets, then you can suddenly have the consequence that if we go out to a bank and say, I would like to borrow some money for a car, And if the bank says, no, you can't do that, and if a lot of banks say that at the same time, you are running the risk of what the IMF worry always has been, that you will have a sudden stop in the economy. So we have suddenly gone from saying what you could say, the sort of the textbook or computable equilibrium model in the Fed world of saying, oh, let's just gradually try to slow things down. And now we're suddenly facing a situation where maybe it's not just a gradual slow grind lower on GDP. Maybe the risk now is that you suddenly will have a sudden stop on people's ability to borrow for cars, to borrow to buy a house, to borrow to your credit card, to borrow on consumer loans. Even corporates who want to build a new factory also might have challenges if the credit conditions really tighten from one day to the other. So what we need to wait for now and what's really important is that for the next weeks and months, we need to find out how severe is the credit contraction in the banking sector because, Mike, to their question, that will determine how quickly the unemployment rate can go up. Under the old system, meaning a week ago, with the Fed basically stepping on the brakes, there were scenarios where that could happen in a gradual and smooth way, and we could have a soft landing, even though there was a lot of debate about that. But now, if you add on the layer here that the risk is that the banks might at the same time, all begin to say, 
we just need to slow down our lending, then that comes with the risk of a sudden stop in consumption, in capex and in hiring, and therefore the risk that the unemployment rate, in the worst case, could start to move higher relatively quickly. So what is, with hindsight in mind, what's the answer? Like, did the Fed raise too much, too fast, or did the Fed not have good oversight of SVB or the other banks? Like, what is the... All the above, maybe? (laughs) So the challenge, of course, for the Fed is that they really only have one tool, namely interest rates. I mean, if you really think about it more broadly, of course, they have three tools. They have interest rates, they have forward guidance, and they have the balance sheet. But I view that from their chairs, I mean, what else could they have done? There was a pandemic. They needed the economy to come back. Then it came back much faster. And then we got a lot of inflation. And then they said, okay, but then we need to cool that down. And then they've been basically trying to cool inflation down. And here we are. Now we are at risk that that cooling inflation down, something broke, as you said, and that resulted then in the risk that we might now have a faster slowdown. So it gets to the old saying that Milton Friedman said that you go into your shower and you turn it on and it doesn't get hot immediately and you wait and then suddenly it gets really hot and then you turn it down and then you wait and then it gets really cold. (laughs) So for the Fed, the risk really here is that um, they have just been really trying to manage as good as they can. Uh, But they are, uh, I mean, it, it has been really, of course, a challenge for them to figure out exactly how much or how little and, and this new situation that has just appeared with the banking sector and the risk, again, because the regional banks are so important in the U.S. economy that suddenly now, if they are beginning to hold back on credit, then it could just have very severe consequences. Proud Rutgers grad, by the way. Did you know that, uh, Milton no, Friedman? No, I had no yeah, idea. I just r- realized that uh, a couple of weeks ago, reading Alan Going Blinder's book. Yeah. You don't hear of many Rutgers economists, but uh, <laughs> he's probably just the, the most prominent. But... You know, Torsten, uh, famously, and you hear this all the time uh, from Chair Powell and, and other uh, Fed officials, is the long and variable lag in the effect of monetary policy. In other words, you know, were they raising rates for more than a year there and everything seemed fine and then, bam, we get we get hit by this, you know, surprise uh, problem with, with the banks. Does it? Do you think that works on the way down with rates too? In other words, uh, even if the Fed were to pivot Im- immediately – and either pause or, or start cutting rates, um, it, is it sort of, that's not going to stop what's coming? You know what I mean? Yeah, the problem with that, of course, is that now funding costs have also gone up. The Frau OIS spread has been widening. You have also seen the IG bank spread also starting to widen. I mean, that the funding costs for banks have increased, not only because of the Fed funds rate going up, but simply because the spread on top of that has also been going up. So that means that if that spread is now so high that it's become very expensive for banks to fund themselves, if the Fed did cut rates tomorrow, then that would be helpful in terms of lowering the funding costs for banks. Yeah. But the answer to your question is, is that when you suddenly have a significant increase in the cost of capital at the very highest level across the economy, then the real answer to do that for the Fed to solve that problem is just to lower interest rates. But the problem is, as you you know, that you put that up on the scale. On the one hand, hey, wait a minute, inflation is 6%. They can't lower. We should actually raise interest rates. On the other side of the scale, you have an apple over here and an orange over here. And you say, well, we put the orange over here because now we should be actually lowering interest rates to improve financial stability. And it really becomes a real challenge for them to suddenly change their views from saying, now it was all inflation, inflation, inflation for so long to now suddenly say, well, now it's financial stability, and now it's not so much inflation. And that's really the the challenge in terms of the decision for the FOMC uh, that they have ahead of them, namely, what are they going to do in response to this when inflation is still so high? Yeah, I've heard uh, described as, you know, the Fed has two fires to put out in one bucket of water, and Presumably, That's a great description. They're they're going to be focused on that inflation fire primarily. Uh, so they, but the problem, of course, is that if they start ignoring the financial stability fire, then uh, the risk, of course, could also the flames could come up quite substantially <laughs> on that front. So, so it is really a challenge. But we let's see where the financial system is in a few weeks. Uh, but for now, I, I I would go into this FOMC meeting if I were on the FOMC and say, okay, you know what, uh, it is absolutely okay to take a pause and we can always just hike rates and we can even hike rates 50 if things really do stabilize. But let's now watch and see how the economy, most importantly, how regional bank credit is doing over the coming weeks and months ahead. The other thing I've heard quite a bit from people I talked to is that the Fed had wanted to tighten financial conditions for the past year and that this period, what's happening now with the banking sector, has tightened them almost more than a 25 basis point hike. 
I'm wondering if you've been thinking about yeah, that so as well. Yeah, so if I, into my Bloomberg screen, look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions yeah. Index. As, as a power I, user. I, right? know, uh-huh. I know. I didn't know about the TAIL one. <laughs> the, no, no, the, the, the Taylor rule the is Taylor fantastic. Rule. And, and no for, for listeners who are unaware, the Taylor rule is simply trying to figure out what the Fed funds rate should be based on inflation and the unemployment rate, right? And only that and nothing else. Yeah, right. And so, and, and the, of course, financial conditions, to your great question, if you look at where they are, there are various ways. The Fed also has St. Louis Fed has a measure. Chicago Fed has a measure. Uh, so, but there are various ways. Uh, Kansas City also has a measure. Goldman but the, has a measure. Everyone has a measure mm-hmm. of financial conditions. But the Bloomberg one, which is real time, which is why I like that the most, is that throughout the day you can actually see where our financial conditions right now. It has certainly tightened, but we are nowhere remotely close to where we were in 2020. And we are definitely far, far away from where we were in 2008. So, yes, it's good that financial conditions have tightened in terms of slowing inflation down, but it's happening in some sense too quickly because it's beginning to raise the risk of financial stability. So yes, financial conditions, you want to tighten that to slow inflation down, but the problem is if that comes with the risk of financial stability, then of course it becomes a quite different matter. You know, you mentioned the spreads as far as bank funding costs go, and I think the Sort of center of that story right now is obviously Credit Suisse. Um, they've had a bad week. I mean, this has been a bank that's surely been the the focus of a lot of concern for a while now. But this week, uh, uh, first, you know, they came out and said, look, we had material weakness in our reporting for the last couple of years. Their auditor, PwC, uh, gave an adverse opinion. Uh, they delayed their, their annual report because of uh, back and forth with the SEC. But really what is causing the acute problem is the chair of the Saudi uh, National Bank, their biggest shareholder, came out and said, we can't buy any more stock for various reasons, but really spooking the market. So how do you see the Credit Suisse playing out? No, and and, and the situation is evolving as we speak here. I, I view this in the broader context of that there's just a lot of uncertainty and instability in the system. And if you are both the ECB and you're the Fed and you look at this, the conclusion would be to say, okay, but we got to have some resolution and some stability to whatever these challenges are at the moment. So I absolutely agree that uh, there are certainly a lot of challenges for markets. And it, we, I mean, as, as, as we move forward, we will see how it's resolved. Uh, but it is clear that uh, this continues to be a broader risk to the macroeconomic outlook if you have financial stability uh, with the intensity that we have at the moment. Why does it matter for U.S. investors if it's happening in Europe? Yeah, so the very important answer to that, of course, is that the global financial system is just highly integrated. Uh, There's some finer nuances that the Chinese banks and Russian banks are somewhat separated from uh, the European and U.S. banks. But uh, across U.S. and Europe, you have so many big U.S. banks operating in Europe. You have so many big European banks operating in the U.S. that the counterparty issues, issues about Everything that has to do with lending and borrowing and ultimately trust uh, will be very important uh, in this regard. So that's why the global financial system is just so integrated and so interlinked in so many different ways that the uh, trust and confidence in each other is just absolutely critical. So, Torsten, you know, we, we obviously have a lot of individual investors uh, and, and some professional money managers, uh, I hope anyway, listening to the show. What's your sort of two minute advice to them on how to approach the rest of the year? So one short answer to the current situation is to buy duration. In other words, if you think that short rates have peaked uh, and you think that the Fed is not going to raise rates more and if you are worried about some slowdown potentially coming, uh, the first answer to that is that you should then begin to worry about, well, maybe long rates are going to go down. Uh, so that means that make sure that you are protected uh, with your risky assets, say the S&P 500, your high yield, your loans and lower rated credit against uh, the potential risk of a slowdown. Investment grade credit and high safe uh, credit assets will still do well uh, if there is a recession. They have historically done that. Uh, so that's another way uh, to quote unquote hide if there is a slowdown. Down, but the textbook would tell you that if there is a risk of a slowdown coming, then uh, you should be in the safest places, which in this situation would be up in quality and long in duration. So IG and treasuries, 
what, 10 years, five years? 30 years. 30 years. Any, depending on as, uh, what, as long as you can get. <laughs> well, and, and as long as it's liquid and you want to make sure that you're ready for, if there is any quick resolution to any of these things, then you could be prepared then to jump into uh, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ again. Uh, but uh, the, the issue here is uh, that nobody really knows um, the duration of how long time this turbulence is going to persist. I feel very strongly that it will not be forever. Uh, it may be over even in a few weeks. In the best case, it could be over in a few days. Uh, but given that this uncertainty is still here and we still need some resolution to a number of the things that we have spoken about here, uh, then uh, for now it will probably take some time. It's like the VIX and uh, thinking about it, the memory of a lot of the things in financial markets is like 20, 30 days. So you probably need, uh, I would say, three, four weeks at least uh, where things are relatively calm uh, before you can get uh, come out of the bushes and see what's going on again. Yeah. Well, and the whiplash in rates this year on the short end, uh, this, this week on the short end, that two-year yield up, I don't know what, uh, down 50, 60 basis points one 60, day, up, up, up 30 the next day. It was just last week 40, that Powell yeah. was saying we'll be hiking a lot more. Yeah, I've, I've lost track of how many Sigma event that is. I know, but that's, the volatility is just the uh, stomach churning here. I mean, it, it's eye-popping what we're seeing. The move index relative to VIX, uh, VIX has also gone up, but the move index, which is implied vol for rates, yep. uh, has also gone up quite significantly because there's just a lot of, and this is of course from options, so this is real money that people are betting yeah. on saying either rates are going to go up, people are willing to pay for that and other people are willing to say no no rates are actually going to go down so that the dispersion of views which is basically what implied vol is the dispersion of views is really really wide yeah. when you have these elevated levels of uncertainty and that makes complete sense different people are doing different things and buying protection against different scenarios because the outcome and the outlook is just so foggy but i feel like a big chunk of the macro hedge fund community must have been caught on the wrong foot uh you know very much a short position in in the short end, uh, according to the CFTC data. Um, A painful week, I mean, is uh, how do you see this week affecting the hedge fund world? Is it, uh, does it add to the worries about risk aversion going forward? Yeah, because the hedge fund macro trade going into this weekend was no landing. Everything yeah. is fine. Inflation is high. We got a high rates. It's slow and gradual. The Fed will go maybe 25, maybe 50, and then 25, 25, 25. And then ultimately, the economy will begin to slow down. But most people were probably thinking in the macro hedge fund community, well, you know what? We probably have another three to six months before I need to worry about that. So for now, I'm still betting on rates higher. And boom, out of the blue this weekend, we now have, of course, a very significant decline in rates over the last few trading sessions here. And the consequence of that, of course, is that uh, a lot of people were just uh, squeezed out of the short positions that they had in fixed income. So back to what you were just talking about um, with the move and the VIX. Katie Greifold and I actually were looking at this this week. The spread between the move index and the VIX on Tuesday was the widest since 2009. And, it, and what we were thinking about is just the pessimism that's been inherent to the bond market for weeks now, whereas maybe on the stock market side, you had, even on Monday, I think we were down 0.15%, which, considering what we're talking about, is sort of, uh, it's impressive, Absolutely. <laughs> I would say. But, but then we had that spread actually narrow a bit, where it does feel like the stock market side is also starting to take things much more seriously. I'm just wondering... What is it that like what what was it that um, because in the stock market, people are known to be optimists, right? (laughs) Yeah. And you have been told for the last 15 years to buy on dips. Yes, exactly. So and you see in the retail flows, we've also seen him in the last uh, several trading sessions that a lot of the buyers are just ETF buyers, meaning retail, because, hey, stocks went down. That's always a good opportunity to go up. But but you're absolutely right. A very there was some very important things going on inside the S and P 500. A rotation, of course, away from regional banks and up towards uh, other sectors that, of course, have been particular cyclicals and financials that have been doing better. Uh, meaning at the at the the bigger financial names. But but the short answer to what you're saying is absolutely. If you think about the VIX and the move index, meaning implied volatility in fixed income and implied volatility in equities, you would think that the story that's being told in the stock market is the same as the story that's being told right. in the rates yeah. market. So you would think that a shock hits the economy, in this case inflation, and suddenly out of the blue, this is only something that's a worry for rates markets. It's not a worry for the stock market. I mean, why was it that the move index has been so elevated now for actually several years relative to the VIX just saying, oh, inflation, that's not for us. That's just for those people over there in bonds. So this divergence and inconsistency, you can't tell 
different stories and different markets. We're living in the same economy, the same financial market. So either the stock market is wrong and needs to be a lot lower and bond markets are right, that things are actually pretty bad and there should be a lot more volatility or vice versa. Maybe the bond market is wrong and maybe inflation will be coming down quickly and maybe we will have a soft landing. That's absolutely not my baseline scenario at this point. And in that case, stocks should be higher. So that's another way of saying that, yes, it's absolutely the case. And I totally agree with what you're saying, that equities have been surprisingly resilient in the face of this inflation shock. Because remember, if we just step back and say, what was it up until recently that the Fed was trying to achieve? The Fed was trying to slow down growth the Fed was trying to slow down consumer spending, slow down hiring, slow down capex spending. In other words, the Fed was trying to slow down earnings. And if I'm told that the Fed is trying to slow down the E in the PE ratio, I should also worry about that maybe that probably means that equities should be going down. But equities have remained incredibly resilient. And the VIX has just been basically saying, oh, this whole issue about slowdown coming. And that's probably because equity investors probably mainly care about the last earnings season and the next earnings season. But if I'm a bond investor, I don't have the luxury of only caring about the last earnings season and the next earnings season. I need to think about what will happen in two years, five years, and even 10 years. So that means that bond investors have said, well, when the Fed raises rates, earnings will slow down. But equity investors have looked at the latest earnings season and said, but it's not slowing down. So why are you so worried? So that's why it was the case of that we were waiting for the lack of monetary policy to eventually slow things down. And equity investors said, but it's not happening. So why are you so worried in bond markets? So that's why there was indeed, as you pointed out in your story with Katie, that there is indeed a very thick inconsistency between what the bond market on the move index side and, and broadly speaking on the level of rates was saying relative to what we were seeing in equity markets. Well, you know, the other big major story of last year was that that traditional inverse bond stock correlation uh, broke down and, and you know, both fell together and worst year for 60-40 in Absolutely. anyone's lifetime. I mean, is and you also pointed out, well, you know, if we do have this risk-off rally in bonds, that does take some of the pressure off of the banks who are long duration. Are we stuck with that uh, correlation, stock bond correlation that we've seen over the last year? Or is there a chance that, uh, you know, this risk off could get so extreme that it kind of returns to the normal correlation? Yeah, that's really important. So absolutely, 60-40 didn't do well. Uh, Obviously, when you both had that bond prices went down and stock prices went down. So now today, of course, uh, up to a week ago, I would also have said 60-40 will continue to not do well. The problem for 60-40 today is that now we have a fairly significant issue about, well, maybe stocks are at risk of really going down because they haven't adjusted to what we just spoke about, namely that there might actually be a slowdown coming, not only because of the Fed hiking rates, but there might also be a slowdown coming because of credit conditions tightening. So the risk to the 60-40 portfolio is that uh, you may be winning something, maybe if rates go lower, but the stock part of your portfolio is just going to get hammered if we do have a recession. So that's another way of saying that at this point, as much as 60-40 is uh, the easy thing to do and then go and play golf or badminton or whatever you do for two years and you come back and say, hey, how is it going? The risk, of course, now is that if you are too overweight in some of those more risky assets that tend to underperform when there's a recession, so that's again lower ready credit and that's, of course, equities, then you run the risk, of course, ultimately that your portfolio will take a hit. So why not just step away from the 60-40 and say, I can actually do some stock picking and credit selection with the idea of if there is a risk of a recession coming, maybe I should just not be in the stock market. Maybe I should just think more about up in quality and credit and maybe, of course, also in duration in bonds. Yeah. Torsten Slock of Apollo, such a treat to get your uh, your uh, views at this crazy time in markets. We we really appreciate it. We can't quite let you go just yet, Vildana. Because we're going to play craziest thing I saw in markets this week, and there's... There's a lot to choose from. So many things. I know, things. if we had done this last week, I had nothing to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> last week, I, I struggled last week. And then this week, I have the First Republic chart up, the... Two-year yield, the ten-year yield, the, the like crazy charts. Yeah. The the financial conditions chart is like. And when when Valdana's looking at yields, you know, it's things are something's yeah, going I wrong. Yeah, I hate the bond market. So yeah. This but is hey, shout wrong. out to uh, Mario D'Angelo for pointing out that uh, HSBC buying Silicon Valley Bank for one, one pound. One pound. I think that is, I think he wins the week for craziest thing. But yeah, let, he let's does. hear what you get. So I uh, am really trying to not think about the banking sector as much, (laughs) which has (laughs) been impossible. But there's a Bloomberg story, which also actually is very sad. It says, if you make $100,000 living in New York City, it feels like 
you're making $36,000 because of taxes and the high cost of living. Ah, $36,000. So it's the worst for any major city. Well, 36000 from 100000 And you still want to buy in New York City? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't make me feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right, 36000 for 100000 in New York. It's, uh, you know... Well, it's funny, you know, with, with the federal tax rate being uh, uniform across the country when you have an issue like that, you know, it is it is a different standard of living. But I'll tell you the craziest thing I saw. This is a Wall Street Journal uh, story, I believe is their A-head, you know, the, the kind of fun story they put on the front page. SVB's collapse brought a niche industry back into focus, financial disaster swag. Sellers have cashed in on SVB's infamy to make money on all sorts of company merchandise that they ha- may have once neglected. So, you know the stuff when you go to a conference and you get, like, the, the freebie handouts? It's all that stuff. So on eBay, there was listings for an SVB-branded blanket for $26, a purse hook for twelve fifty. I don't know what a purse a purse hook. No clue. That's a weird shot. I can get you one if you want one. And a cheese board for $200. I don't know why the cheese board is the most expensive. You're not going to make us guess prices? No, I, I feel like they're up for sale on eBay, so we don't really have the proper price discovery. But I will say uh, uh, it's a pretty good story. You read it if you haven't yet. Um, and it's also inspired sort of fake swag from the, the banks, like uh, Silicon Valley Bank Risk Management Department t-shirts are selling very well. <laughs> well, remember there were all those FTX t-shirts that had to be thrown out in the garbage uh, well right and they well they they might have November they might have you know oh, are uh, they up for their, sale their too? bankruptcy administrator maybe should have kept on to them because oh. they, they'd probably sell pretty well they quote one woman who bought an ugly Christmas sweater that read FTX risk management department 2020 how much did she pay for it they don't say um, I don't know an ugly Christmas sweater though but that's pretty good I like that one Thurston, how about you? What's what's the craziest thing you saw this week? Well, I'll just follow up on what we just talked about. I mean, the incredible thing is that we have inflation at 6% and we're sitting talking about how sharp will the slowdown be. The fact that we have high inflation and we're debating, will this be a hard landing or if we're really lucky, will it be a soft landing? It's just incredible. I mean, normally we have had for a long, long, long time inflation just at 2%. So the fact that, that we have this incredibly complicated macro backdrop of inflation being high while the economy is now poised to slow down. I think that's pretty crazy. It really is. I think unlike any other setup uh, any of us have ever experienced. Well, and that's why, the, as we just spoke about, the FOMC meeting here ahead of us is just a, a real challenge. I mean, because how do you deal in an environment where inflation is normally something that you would worry about as the number one thing, and that's what you said for the last 18 months, this is our top priority. And now suddenly you're having a meeting where you're saying, well, by the way, now there's something else that's our top priority, yeah. namely financial stability. So for us in markets, it's about figuring out how long time is this financial stability issue going to be such an issue that's at such a level that the Fed will worry about and that the ECB will worry about it. Is this just, again, a few days, a week or maybe two? Or is this something that's going to be long and lasting? At some point, we will go back to a more calm and, uh, and quite frankly, more boring environment. Uh, and we can, <laughs> can't, we can't wait. wait to get to that. <laughs> I can't wait. But, well, and, the, uh, we're here. and the timing t- for all this to happen in the middle of the Fed's quiet period before the meeting is... Uh, so they can't communicate um, um, about it. And that's, of course, also the challenge. Yeah. But it, it is really... A, it is really, it's it's really difficult for them yeah. because these challenges are really significant when you have things moving. That's back to your story, Alana, here about that the move index telling us volatility is just really high in so many different ways. And that's what, of course, is uh, creating this uh, complicated environment. It really is a credit selectors and a stock pickers environment where you need to say, I can't just buy the index. I need to be much more careful with what I do, right. given the risks that I'm seeing. Right, right. I think if I was Jay Powell, I'd, maybe I'd call out sick next week. You think yeah, you, me too. You can get away with that. <laughs> That would probably cause a bigger problem. <laughs> anyway, I think that is all the time we're able to steal from you today. Torsten Slock, Chief Economist of Apollo Global Management. So great to catch uh, up with you and hear your thoughts. Thank you for your time and hope we can talk again soon. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Torsten. Thank you. What goes up? We'll be back next week. Until then, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal website and app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you took the time to rate and review the show so more listeners can find us. And you can find us on Twitter. Follow me, at Vildana Hyrick. Mike Regan is at Reganonymous. 
You can also follow Bloomberg Podcasts at Podcasts. What Goes Up is produced by Stacey Wong, and our head of podcasts is Sage Bauman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.